Hi folks and welcome to part one of Residential Network Cabling. Uh, I'm Ron with Ideal Industries and I'm going to step you through uh, why we go about uh, wiring our homes properly for low voltage wires and why we should do that and how to go actually go out and actually make that happen. You know, structured wiring in a home today is something that's kind of fairly new to us really in the, I'm going to say last, say, 20 years or thereabouts. You know, we've never wired our homes properly for uh, what we call structured wiring or low voltage cabling. I mean, if you go out traditionally and go about and buy a home, you're lucky to get a couple phone jacks and a couple cable TV jacks. And, uh, you know, God forbid with a guy or a builder put a, a data jack anywhere in that in that home. And more likely not, unless you made him do it. So uh, today, with computers basically being in our lives for the last 30-some years, it really makes a lot more sense that we wire the home properly for low-voltage applications. And I'll tell you, for about 1% to 2% of a cost of a brand new home, you can wire it like the standards tell you to, which is putting basic phone, data, and video in all portions of the home. And, of course, you can go crazy above that if you'd care to because home automation, the sky is really kind of the limit. Now, the reason we've never really wired our homes properly for this is because it's not in the National Electric Code. The NEC is very precise on how to wire home properly for uh, uh, electrical applications, but not for low-voltage applications. And it's one of the reasons why we've never really gotten our homes wired properly like we should. Now, one of the best tips I'll give folks as you get into low-voltage applications is that is to actually subscribe to lots of different trade magazines and do a lot of reading and uh, immerse yourself into the industry, so to speak. And uh, I can tell you, it can be very expensive to keep yourself educated. Uh, uh, you can go to trade shows, you can take online courses and others, and you can spend hundreds if not thousands of dollars to do that. And uh, in the low voltage world, if you don't know it, things change pretty quickly and it's important to stay up. So I tell everybody, uh, read the trade magazines, uh, uh, subscribe to the blogs and things like that. You know, and if, on the magazines, stick them in the bathroom. You'd be surprised what you learn if you read them somewhere down the road. And uh, electrical contractor, here's a great magazine which has a low voltage section to it today that it did not have many years ago. CE Pro is also another great magazine if I'm trying to keep up with uh, the audio and video people and figure out what's going on with Blu-ray and HDMI and all that good, good stuff. Cabling uh, installation and maintenance is another good one. Uh, if you're in the security industry, there's the security magazines. And, uh, you know, these folks will sell your name, and you're going to get start getting magazines from lots of folks. But uh, uh, if you're looking for more education later down the road, that's one of the first places I'll, I'll actually uh, uh, suggest that people start uh, adding to what they actually read, okay? Now, you know, as I said a minute ago, home automation is really kind of the sky is the limit. I mean, uh, if you want to be able to push the remote on a, the button on the remote over there one time, and the drapes close, the lights dim down, and the TV drops out of the ceiling, and your chair over here hits the massage mode. They can do it. It just costs you money. And uh, so home automation uh, is very interesting today. And we're finally getting to that George Jetson's house that we were all kind of promised about 40 or 50 years ago. So uh, uh, very interesting stuff happening in the world today. And uh, if you're not familiar with uh, certain companies like Crestron and AMX, and uh, Microsoft has something they call Media Center, uh, and also Control 4, but there are other home automation type companies you can find out there. And uh, the, they can do basically anything you want. It's just a matter of make, uh, bringing them enough money and they can make it happen for you. Now, uh, these systems, as a general rule, are, are considered wired systems. And, uh, you know, I kind of prefer wire over wireless any day of the week if I can get it uh, for several reasons. One is wired is, is uh, always faster than wired. Uh, wireless, I should say, and um, and for the other thing, you know, wireless systems, thing you broadcast in the air can be deciphered. So I like to side on the side of having lots of wires and walls if I can get away with them. But you know, if you're not just doing new construction and you're doing remodel work, there'll be times when wireless may be the only way you can get it done. And uh, uh, I would turn you on to uh, two organizations in the industry. One's called Zigbee, and the one's called Z-Wave. And these guys are international in scope. And if you were looking for a wireless solution, to uh, what you're needing to do, uh, I'll bet they might have an, an application or a product to sell you. Now, besides wired and wireless systems, there are, is a group of, of organizations out there we refer to as no new wire technologies. And an example of that is MOCA, Multimedia Over Coax Alliance. And uh, uh, I bet a lot of you guys have probably seen the direct TV commercial where a guy's watching a, a movie in one room moved over into the kitchen and picked up the movie on that kitchen TV at the same spot and then moved into the, uh, I think it was the living room, 
and uh, picked up that movie in the living room at the exact same spot. That's actually an example of, of Mocha technology that the satellite companies are utilizing. And you might even find that used more in the cable TV world as things go on, because at this point in time, uh, the cable TV companies basically put a set-top box on every TV they're trying to control. If we could do that through one set-top box and through Mocha control multiple uh, TVs, well, maybe that might be a better option. So uh, be something to be looking for more and more there. Another option out there is Home P&A, which is Home Phone Network Alliance, and this is kind of pushed by the telco people. And, you know, if they want to be able to offer the triple play to a customer, you know, basic phone, data, and video applications to the home, um, you know, how are they going to do that over existing wires in, in homes? And they do it over the coax and existing phone wires. And uh, uh, But essentially that, that technology is kind of really pushed by the telco people. Now, there is also uh, another way of doing things, if we really come, came down to it, and that is what we call power line technology. And power line has been around for actually quite a few years now. And this is where we're going to actually uh, put a writer signal on top of an AC signal and uh, send that signal across uh, the electrical wires in the walls. And a good example of these things that you can go out and find are uh, these little devices. Basically, you can plug into any electrical outlet in a wall, uh, plug, say, a high-speed internet line into that uh, device, and then take a second one of these devices and plug it into another electrical outlet anywhere in the building uh, or in the home, I should say, uh, long we're all on the same, same uh, tap. Uh, anyway, and then uh, plug a, a high-speed internet or a computer into that and then uh, provide internet across the electrical wires in the walls. So you'll find there's always downsides to any of these applications you might run across versus pulling brand new wire but there are lots of different ways of getting things done today if we're not down, down to pulling brand new uh, wire and brand new walls, okay? So again, the home automation, the sky is really the limit as to what you can potentially do for folks. And uh, if we wired a home properly, we could do a number of things that are on this list. And obviously, networking of computers has kind of become much, pretty much a given for most folks today. Uh, we've had PCs in our lives for pushing 30-some years, and for some of us, it's been in our life from our entire life. So... Uh, more likely, we'll, we'll go on uh, internet access and networking of computers in the building. You know, another one on this list is uh, home theater, and I kind of chuckle when people talk about installing home theaters because uh, you can spend a lot of money here. I mean, a boatload if you really care to. Uh, and whether you spend a little bit of money or a lot of money, whatever you have is something probably better than what you had before. So, uh, but those, that's a kind of a more and more common one. Video surveillance and intercom systems and security systems or something else that uh, you might definitely want to be think about adding to uh, what you offer to customers. Uh, Multi-room audio is another one that is actually fairly simple to install and uh, fairly inexpensive compared to other things at times. And uh, it's one that folks really tend to love to have, be able to listen to music throughout the home. Two others on that list are home lighting control systems and heating and HVAC systems as well. And obviously, we are all trying to save more energy and become more of a lean and green kind of technologies out there. And I think you'll see that as a, another driving factor to more home automation in the homes. And obviously, cable and satellite applications, CCTV and CATV, uh, are, are, are obviously things we would maybe want to have in the home as well. But uh, two big ones on this board that I tell contractors that if you're not looking into today, you ought to think of. And one is smart appliances. And... Uh, uh, in the last, oh, I'm going to say 15 years or thereabouts, in the, we've seen a lot more smart appliances. And, uh, you know, they tell us the average home has roughly four to six IP addressable items in it today. And they're betting in the next 15, 20 years, that's going to be somewhere maybe in the neighborhood of 30 IP addressable items in the house. And uh, uh, we're really not that far away from the knock on the front door being the Maytag guy saying, hey, your washing machine called me. Uh, because it's got something inside it that can monitor itself, something goes wrong with it, it can dial out to uh, the uh, uh, service contract people and tell them what's wrong with it, so when they come up, they've got the right product to fix it, uh, or part to fix it. And uh, I tell you, smart appliances, uh, you could buy refrigerators today with LCD screens on them. Uh, I've even seen those where they're wireless. Uh, uh, there's lots of cool things going on with smart appliances, so that's another trend to be looking for. And by the way, have you heard of IP version 4 versus IP version 6 internet addresses? And if you haven't, uh, we actually ran out of internet addresses and uh, uh, no one ever thought 20 years ago that would happen. But today it actually has. And part of it is because of all these different appliances that are out there. Now, the biggest one on the board, I tell contractors, if you're not looking at this new opportunity here, you really ought to. 
and that's called home health monitoring systems. And uh, I tell you guys, uh, the baby boom generation is finally hitting retirement, and because of that, uh, we're one of the largest portions of the United States population, about 80 million people. And, you know, there's just essentially not enough nursing facilities in this country to take care of all these people. So, uh, you know, what are we going to do with that? You know, we got to keep mom and dad in their home longer. So how do we do that? Well, we can certainly monitor mom and dad as they get up and move around the house and with motion detectors and cameras and things like that. Uh, we could dispense medicines remotely today if you'd care to. Uh, heck, they've even got sensors for beds, and we could tell if mom gets out of bed in the middle of the night and is not back in bed in 20 minutes, it might set off alarms. So I tell contractors, home health monitoring systems is a very big trend that we see coming in the future here. And when I go to trade shows and uh, I sit through those kind of courses, uh, they're absolutely packed because people see those as a great opportunity. Okay, now. Uh, if you're looking for a generic term for all these little things we might actually wire the home for, the systems we put in people's homes would, are referred to as residential structured wiring systems. So if you're looking for a term to slap on the side of the old truck, well, there you go. And um, if the code book does not tell us how to wire the home properly, where do we go to find out how to do that today? And uh, we, th in that case, we'll go to what we call a standard. And if you're not familiar with standards versus codes, a standard is more or less a best practice technique. It's how things ought to operate once you walk away from them. I like to tell people that the National Electric Code guy who inspects the house, he's never going to adjust the TV picture on the TV. He don't care. Uh, where in a standard, we would actually would kind of care how those things perform. And we've had standards in the commercial industry and the telecommunications side since the, really the mid-80s. Uh, but this standard, the 570C, has actually been out since uh, uh, 2004, and it's the telecommunication standard here for residential uh, infrastructure in residential homes in, in North America. So, And again, the ANSI is the American National Standards Institute, and the TIA is the Telecommunications Industry Alliance. So those folks have to uh, put out this standard. And I don't give guys copy of this thing. If you go online and go to buy one here, and I'll show you in a little bit where you can buy one, uh, they're going to want like 150 bucks. So um, uh, you, it's not free if you go buy them. It's kind of like the co book when you go buy those. Okay. So uh, those, uh, that's the document we're going to use to actually tell us how to go about wiring home properly. Okay. Now, as installers, you deal with basic things like code standards and regulations. And I tell folks that, uh, you know, if, if this is not initially a, a code class, so to speak. And I tell contractors, if you've never taken a code class in your life, it wouldn't hurt you none. And, but you should know the NEC is produced by the National Fire and Protection Agency, and it's upgraded every three years. And they're going, about ready to launch the 2014 code book right now. Uh, the current code is the 011, but your local city or jurisdiction is going to be working on an older version of a code book. And matter of fact, they can write their own version of a code book if they care to. Now, the codes are enforced by local government en enforcement folks, and uh, I tell contractors, if you run the other way on job sites when you see code enforcement people, uh, you look a little on the guilty side, so turn around and, and buy the code enforcement guy a cup of coffee and, and find out what they do and don't know about the National Electric Code. Uh, but, uh, 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 again, uh, work with those folks and make sure you are wiring things properly to the codes. Now, if I was going to ask you as a low-voltage contractor to take a look at the NEC uh, and what parts I would ask you to read, one would be Article 250, which is grounding and bonding in a building. And uh, low-voltage wires, uh, absolutely by code, have to be grounded. Some people think that's not true, uh, but by code should be grounded properly as they enter the building. And uh, they tell us that a number one cause of bad grounding in buildings, believe it or not, is loose connections. you got to understand these things tend to heat up and they cool down and they heat up and they cool down and over time they do get loose. And uh, uh, so I'm sure we all go outside and tighten the lugs on the ground rods on the outside of the home once in a while, but, uh, you know, it's not actually a bad idea. And if you've got an older electrical panel, uh, I'll almost bet there's probably loose connections in it someplace. Okay, So Article 250 is a good one to read. Uh, chapter 3 gets into how to pull wire. And I'll actually give you something better to read here in a few minutes. Um, because you've got to understand the National Electric Code doesn't address anything under 18-gauge wire, essentially. And, uh, and um, you know, our little 24-gauge wire and our category wires uh, can be damaged if you pull them wrong. And so, uh, and I love to give contractors... Uh, uh, electrical contractors a little uh, uh you know heck about you know well, you know have you ever pulled bromex and your outer jackets on the cables a, a couple feet longer than the copper inside <laughs> well you haven't ruined that romex to a point where you wouldn't use it but uh in uh, category wire when we pull that kind of pulling tension on it we'll actually stretch it and 24 gauge wire becomes you know 26 gauge or something else 
Okay. Now, Article 640 and 725, uh, 640 gets into auto signal processing equipment. Uh, Article 725 gets into what is a class 1, 2, and 3 wire, and we'll get into that later on in the presentation about what those things mean. And then Articles 800 through 810, 20, and 30 gets into uh, low voltage applications, but covers a lot about the type of cabling you might want to use, you know, inside or outside of a building, how to ground it properly. But it is not going to tell you how many electrical outlets to put in the house like it would, like the National Electric Code does for electrical outlets. You know, every 12 foot along a wall, you're supposed to put in a, an additional outlet in the, in the rooms to eliminate the need for extension cords. But it does not say those kinds of things. Uh, for the low voltage applications. We'll have to go to the standards to get that information, okay? Now, another uh, organization you deal with as an installer out there are governmental rules, and one of those organizations you'll run across is the FCC. Now, the Federal Communication Commission is an organization that a lot of us really have no idea what these folks do, but uh, if you don't know, they carry a fairly big stick here in the United States, and uh, for one thing, they tell us what frequencies things can operate at. And, for instance, they'll tell us where the AM and FM radio stations can be on the radio dial. They tell us what frequencies the TV stations broadcast at, uh, what your cell phone broadcasts at. And uh, this is an example of their frequency allocation chart on their homepage. And I tell guys, if you can understand that frequency allocation chart, you are somewhat of an Einstein. But, uh, uh, but the FCC did something big for us back in July of 2000. And that is they outlawed old telephone wire and what we refer to as old POTS wire, plain old telephone service wire. A lot of us would know it as quad wire or the old red, green, yellow, black telephone type of wire we've used for years and years and years. Now you can imagine how much of that cabling is actually installed in the United States and there's got to be literally thousands and thousands and miles and miles and miles of it. So we'll be dealing with it for lots and lots of years to come. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. In July of 2000, the, uh, the FCC basically outlaws old POTS wire, and we're trying to get rid of it. And they drew a line in the sand at that point and said, at this point, we're going to go use, start using CAT3 cable. Okay? Now, CAT3 cable was designed back in the no late 1980s, and uh, in July of 2000, it's still somewhat of a viable cable. But uh, anything we thought was smoking hot wire in the 1980s isn't so smoking hot anymore. And at this point in time, Cat3 cable is not even recognized by the standards, even though the FCC still says that's the minimum. Cat5e has really become the new minimum. And uh, uh, so uh, now the reason we had to go to, to and, uh, get away from old telephone wire and start using category wire is the last bullet there that talks about crosstalk in cabling. Now, in old phone circuits, old noise and crosstalk between two pairs is, and if you've ever used an old analog phone and you can actually hear somebody else faintly talking in the background, what's going on there is you've got two telephone pairs sitting very close together. And um, anytime you put current down a conductor, it's going to radiate a magnetic field. And that magnetic field actually crosses the pair next to it, which happens to be the pair you're listening on. And uh, it actually induces a little bit of voltage into that pair, which is that of the conversation that you can faintly hear in the background. And uh, that's a good example of crosstalk in, in telephone wires. Now, in uh, data networking cable, it's the same problem. So this but uh, unfortunately, computers don't know what to listen to, what not to listen to. So we've got to eliminate this noise or crosstalk in the cabling. And magically, that's how category wire works. And physically, the big difference in all these category wires and their ratings between the CAT3, we went to CAT4 and 5E and 6 and 6A, is the amount of twisting we're doing in the pairs. And we'll get into later on how that twisting actually eliminates noise or crosstalk in the pairs. And uh, that's a big difference between old telephone wire and new uh, category wire that we're installing today. Now, the residential standard, as I said earlier, is called the 570C. And uh, as I said earlier, too, uh, the one about $150 a copy of it, and I'll show you in a minute where you can go get this, but it's the document that's going to tell us how to wire the home properly for low-voltage applications and basically phone, data, and video. Uh, anything beyond that to them is kind of gravy. Now, keep in mind, all standards you run across are minimum levels of performance. You can always wire something or make something better than a standard. And examples of, you know, of this would be, uh, you know, for instance, uh, Cat5, E, CAT6, those are all standards, and how do cable manufacturers differentiate themselves from other cable manufacturers is they will actually make a wire rated better than what the standard said it has to be. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen a box of 
Cat5 cable, uh, or 5E cable, and it has a little E on it. The little E stands for enhanced cabling. Uh, if you've ever seen a box with a capital E on it, Cat5E with a capital E, uh, that's a super enhanced cable, and there's a cable manufacturer that's actually made to wire better than what the standard says it has to be. And, of course, the argument always is that if uh, the walls are down and you're installing wire, you ought to be putting in the best quality wire you can afford because somewhere down the road you will be ripping it out and replacing it with the next quality wire that comes out somewhere down the road because uh, these computers are not getting any slower, folks. And um, you look at buildings that are 20 and 30 years old, they've been rewired a number of times in that time frame because, of the, of the the again, the computers get faster and faster and faster. Now, the flip side of this is, folks, I tell contractors, be careful of minimal compliance stuff, too. And uh, is there a place for minimal compliant cabling and connectivity? I think there is in residential especially, but maybe not in commercial type of work. Uh, but be careful with this. And uh, if you find a, a Category 5E cable on sale online for $45 a box, not the 70 or $80 a box it's costing you right now, um, uh, I tell contractors, the alarms ought to be going off in your head. And you can find some very minimal compliant cable, never got inspected by anybody, um, and uh, pairs can be fused together. Uh, one thing I really hate about some of that wire is uh, uh, all the whites in it are, in the four pairs are all white. There is no white blue, there is no white brown, there is no white green or, or white orange. So all those pairs or, or conductors are white. So when you go to terminate them, it's a little bit harder to work with, but uh, just so be aware of the fact you can get minimal compliance stuff as well. Now, if you're an electrical or you are a contractor wanting to get into more and more in commercial work in the uh, uh, rep telecommunications side of the business, uh, you ought to be looking into these other related standards that are out there. And uh, uh, there's what we call the 568C, and that's the telecommunica telecommunications uh, standard here in, the, in really North America, and it's the document that's going to tell us how to wire up basically all commercial applications. You will also run across the 569 standard, and uh, that's, it, I tell contractors, if, you, if there's ever a standard that's actually a good read, this one's pretty good. It's called uh, Telecommunications Pathways and Spaces. It's a great document that tells us how to actually uh, pull wire, and it's going to tell you your conduit fill rates, uh, degrees of bend to put in the conduit, pulling tensions, uh, we can tell you how to wire up a, a cable tray, even how to dig a trench from one building to the next, how deep and how wide and how latest things in a trench. So it's a, actually a very good read. 606B is a uh, actually labeling standard, and I tell contractors, you know how I can quickly tell a professional from a non-professional contractor is the fact that they are labeling their cables properly according to what the industry recommends today. And uh, it's not a, a, a Sharpie, you know, writing on the end of a wire kind of thing. And uh, because, you know, guys, if you do not label your cable as you lay in, it is a pain to come in behind you and actually find anything. And uh, last I checked, I don't know of anybody who likes to trace wires. So uh, start labeling your cable out there and invest in one of those little labeling machines and uh, make it look like you, were, uh, you knew what you are doing. Now, uh, the last one there, 607, it's the uh, generic telecommunication standard for what we call bonding and grounding. And that's a, a standard that goes above what a code book says you have to do for grounding in a building. And you'll find that these uh, telecommunication guys in these data centers can actually get very, very picky about the quality of grounding you might provide to them. And uh, those are living documents. They get upgraded every five years. And, uh, you know, I think the last time I bought all those, that was close to 800 bucks. So uh, be aware of that those standards are out there for you as well. This course I'm putting you through on my channel is a great course to take, but if you're looking for some online training later down the road, you might go check out Infocom sometime. And if you guys need any help in the audio video world, you don't quite understand how video is created and compressed and uncompressed or the difference between 1080i and P and all that kind of good stuff, you might go check out Infocom. They have uh, several certifications you can go out after if you care to. Uh, and might run you 100 to $200 in an online course. Now, if you need help in the phone data world, you might look into CompTIA. And again, they offer some help and training in those areas as well. Now, you might find a local junior college or maybe a local supply house that offers some training as well. And folks, you know, keeping yourself educated in this industry is very, very important. And a lot of folks ask me a lot of times about, you know, will I be certified once I take one of my courses? Well, my answer to that is certified in what and by who. You can find all kinds of certifications out there in this industries, 
But what's the worst thing about being certified? And that is the fact you've got to maintain the certification. So whether that's a Cisco certification, Microsoft, or you know a, a Bixi certification of some sort, it could take a lot of time and energy to actually keep yourself upgraded and um, uh, and educated. So be aware of the fact that uh, any certification you go out out, in, out after in the industry can uh, cost you a little bit of money to maintain the darn certification. Now here's a slide on some more information later down the road. You can always drop me an email if you care, guys care to. I'll be glad to try and point you in a direction if I can help you out. But some other things on this list here is one is uh, global engineering documents. So if you guys are looking to buy any of the standards I mentioned about in the uh, course today, uh, global engineering is the only company not in the United States allowed to print and resell them. So if you need to go buy some uh, standards, that's uh, where you want to go. Now on the bottom there on the left, low voltage license information, uh, that contractorslicense.org does a great job of, of helping you find out do or don't I need a license in a particular market or state. Uh, and you'll find more and more states are requiring a license for low voltage applications. Um, uh, so you, it varies between states and, and counties and so on and so forth. Um, those other websites there also do some nice information about whether or not you do or don't need licenses as well. Now, I tell contractors, the bottom one on the right is security, and that's the Security Association, the Electronic Security Association. And anyway, you know, if you're going to become a low-voltage contractor, I tell guys, you might as well do it all, man. You're doing the phone, the data, the audio, the video, including the security work. Now, you always need a license, but uh, what the heck? I mean, these guys pull coax, and they pull cattery wire. It's the same stuff. It's just that they're specifically designed for security applications, and... Uh, it's just one more thing to get your arms around and do. Now, in the middle on the right there, I do have a YouTube channel if you ever want to go check it out. And I have snippets of the day. And obviously, if you have uh, are taking this course, you probably ran across that channel. But uh, uh, So go look at it and uh, don't expect anything fancy. That's all shot down in my wood shop in my basement. So, uh, uh, But I think the content's pretty good. The website right below that, if I can plug a guy, it's the swhowto.com. And if you want an independent opinion about what structured wiring ought to be in a home, uh, this website is a really good one, and it's put up by a guy who uh, years ago couldn't figure out none of this out and actually uh, figures it out and produces a website, and, and I thought he did a pretty good job. And uh, so go check him out. He is just an independent opinion about structured wiring in a home. The website right below that is another good one you ought to understand. That's the SCTE, and that's the Society of Cable Telecommunication Engineers. And... Uh, if you want to figure out how cable and satellite companies do what they do, this is the organization you're going to go to. And one great thing about the SCTE is they have all kinds of standards, too, on you know set-top boxes and splitters and connectors and cables and things like that. And the great thing about the SCT is they give their information out for free. If you want to get the standard on, say, a splitter or an F connector, you can download it off their website. And when you go out and buy product, make sure that your product you're buying is compliant with their standards because uh, you'll notice that when the cable TV guy typically comes in a home and, and what's he normally start doing when he sees other people's splitters and connectors, he cuts them off and put in his versions of it because he knows his are good and you cannot tell from the outside of a splitter if it's any good. So it's a, another good little organization to get to know. And the one below that is the IEEE which is the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. And, uh, you know, for most of us, we don't care how, care how any of this stuff works. But if you ever want to figure out how your computer network does what it does, or your wireless network, uh, your cell phone, any of these systems work, you would go to the IEEE, which is the, is the International Electrical Electronic Engineers. And uh, uh, they are just a great group of guys to kind of follow as well. Now, Two other big industry organizations you might think of joining. Uh, one is called Bixi, which is Building Industry Consulting Services International. And they're headed out of uh, Tampa there, and they're just big in the phone data world. And if you want to get into anything in the phone data world, you want some training in that area, they got inside plant, outside plant, wireless, data networking, you name it, they've got probably a program you can go out after a certification too. And I've never taken a Bixie class that I did not like, and I've actually taken quite a few over the years. So they're a pretty good organization as well. Now, they are great phone data, but they don't do nothing in the audio-video world. And there's another group of people you get to know, and that's called Custom Electronic Design Installation Association, or CEDIA is another group you might look into. And... Um, uh, Cedia is uh, headquartered out of Indianapolis, and I tell you what, 
Uh, when I get to go to their trade shows and you walk through that trade show as a geek, you kind of salivate walking through this thing because of all the cool electronics and things that they've got. Uh, not much is cheap, but they've got some very neat things here. And uh, so uh, CD is another great little organization. And again, they offer all kinds of training if you're looking and needing help in more of the audio video world. And uh, so those are some organizations, again, folks, that you can always go to later down the road if you need more help. Or, again, uh, drop me a note. Maybe I can help you out as well. Hey, do me a favor. Go check out my YouTube channel. It's Ron Kipper Datacom. And uh, you can find snippets of uh, all kinds of trainings and product on it. And I really appreciate you guys watching it. And if you ever need me, drop me a note. Maybe I can help you point you in the right direction. Hey, thank you for uh, attending and, and watching this uh, course this, uh, this afternoon. And uh, my name is Ron with Ideal Industries. And I will plan on seeing you on the next one.